ever do we do it in one step. We find a problem and fix it. It's done. It's always iterations and iterations to finally six weeks later or five weeks later, whatever, to get it resolved. A little bit of experience was with uh, the agile software development. And I read a little, I've read, done some reading on that and, uh, you know, how that was, it was kind of came about because of that constant change in software, which we have very similar constant change in construction. And so it led to the daily huddles and the check-ins and the sprints. And, you know, whether yep. you do a one week, two week, three week sprint, you know, I, I consider that like a, a, like a six week look ahead, you know, Hey, here's, yep. here's the chunk that we're, that's right in front of us. How are we going to do it? You know, are we pull planning it? Um, and then, and then meeting every day. I think that's, that's what I really thought scrum was and still sort of think it is uh, at a high level is that constant checking in, constant statusing, constant updating, constant uh, constraint removal, you know, being very um, uh, aggressive with the constraints. And I, I think that's really a gold mine for a project to stay in flow, uh, to not get out of whack and get all hurry up and wait is to really the, to attack those constraints. So I know that's an element of it too, but uh, maybe that's my own narrow focused no. uh, little piece of it. Dave, everything you said is 99.8% correct. Sweet. Yeah, the All only right. point, too, is that it's not constant statusing. Like, as people do work, and if they visualize their work with sticky notes or they've used a digital solution, doesn't matter. The statusing is made visual so that it's simple, and anyone can stand back and see the status at any given time 24-7. Just like in a good last planner system, if people are actually marking off their tags as they go, and they're checking in every single day. You don't have mm -hmm. to status things. You can just step up to the pull planning boards and see what's going on. Scrum and Last Planner System have the same foundation. Both came out in the 1990s as uh, frameworks, yeah. for as pull system frameworks. They're very similar. Mm -hmm. One thing I find is we think like, oh, we find a constraint, we remove a constraint. Or I'm actually liking the, I've used constraint as the word. I know now it's more like roadblocks. Whereas a constraint might be, hey, we're up against a rail uh, a railroad line or a power line on the north side. That's a constraint. We can't access the north side because of the power lines or something like right. that. And I get it. That's more of a constraint versus a roadblock, meaning... Uh, we don't know the fire hydrant locations and we need to get them answered or something like that. With constraint logs and with tracking, I, lo I love tracking them visually in the meeting space. I love to keep the, all the running active uh, constraints up on a board. Um, I like to call them icebergs sometimes when I'm coaching. Like if you're out in the North Atlantic and you see an iceberg, you know, six miles out, it's, you know, it's a piece of cake. You got plenty of time to adjust and steer around the iceberg. But if it's 600 feet out or 60 feet out, you, you, you've probably got a problem. You're going to hit it. So I like that visual part of it, but what I find is, is it's always a, it's never a, we got a problem and we answered it. You know, it's always like, well, I sent in the thing. They sent back more questions. Okay. Then I sent them some more stuff and then they want some samples. And then we, we did some things and, and we know there's always this, this series, a series of things over a period of weeks before you actually wrestle the constraint to the ground. So, uh, you know, I like to make sure that, um, at, at least in my last planner coaching, that we're doing that. We're, we're, we're keeping that, keeping track of that. And that's why I said constant statusing, uh, yeah. if you will, or uh, because we don't have, um, you know, boards or a lot of times or iPads or apps that show a progress bar or something like that. It just says, okay, but it's, it's, it's a reminder of the team at least once a week, if not every day, where are we at? What did we do? Have we, have we moved the ball forward? So it's how do we capture that and keep that live is what, um, th that's what I meant by uh, constant statusing. Dave, that is perfect. Fantastic. Welcome to the EBFC show, the easier, better for construction podcast. I'm your host, Felipe Engineer Manriquez. This show is all about the business of construction. Today's episode is sponsored by Bosch Refine My Site is a cloud-based construction collaboration platform that applies lean principles to enable your entire team to plan, communicate, and execute in real time. It's the digital tool that works in tandem with your last planner system process and puts it all together in one simple collaborative ecosystem. System. This easy to use platform is available in English, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and French and can be used on desktops, tablets, and mobile devices. According to Spencer Easton, scheduling manager at Oakland Construction, Refine My Site, in my opinion, is the best, leanest tool on the market for the last planet. Here's what our users have to say. 
We've looked at three other digital scheduling platforms and none compare to the straightforward approach Refund My Site takes. From milestone planning all the way down to daily tasks, this program gives every general contractor and their trade partners meaningful collaboration, accountability, and KPIs. Register today to try Refine My Site for free for 60 days. Today's show is also sponsored by the Lean Construction Institute. LCI is working to lead the building industry in transforming its practices and culture. Its vision is to create a healthy and thriving industry that delivers outstanding project outcomes every time for everyone. Check the show notes for more information. Now, to the show. Welcome to the show, Dave McNeil. Dave, it is my honor to have a person with your experience and travel world traveler worldwide lean implementer to be on the show sharing with our audience some of these nuggets of wisdom hard fought nuggets of wisdom happy to have you on the show and even happier that i did get to shake your hand hashtag irl in real life happy to be here let the good people of the ebfc show know who you are how you got into the biz and uh, what you got cooking right now yeah, well, um, so I uh, I went to school for construction. I've always wanted to be a construction. I thought I wanted to be a civil engineer, uh, but I really wanted to be a, a more of a construction manager. And I thought you had to be a civil engineer to do that. And um, quickly found that engineering was not my forte uh, in the calculus and physics and chemistry classes that you have to take in engineering at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, go Bearcats. Go Bearcats. And, uh, <laughs> So um, switched to uh, found construction management, which was a fairly new degree, and um, that that's what that's what I loved because it was kind of like half business, uh, half engineering. So it was like business light plus engineer or engineering light, and and really a construction focus. So did that, um, did a co-op program. So it took me five years to get out, but I graduated with um, almost two full years of experience, and um, had a really cool co-op pro- uh, job in Florida. I actually worked out at uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Base on a Titan IV rocket assembly building, uh, third largest enclosed space building in the world um, after the uh, VAB for the shuttle and the Boeing uh, uh, 777 plant in uh, Washington. So super cool project, Um, super fired up about um, big league construction. I mean, this was like a 45 story building and they put rockets in it and put them together in the building and they take it out to the launch pad and shoot it off. So uh, super cool. And um, so that kind of got me started in in the construction world. I uh, right out of school, then went with uh, Baker Concrete. So I had a 20 plus year career uh, with Baker Concrete, uh, nation's largest concrete subcontractor. I think they're number 16 or 17 uh, in size and volume of all subcontractors out there, mechanical, electrical, all of those. So the um, um, that's where I found lean. So I I'd spent about 15 years, um, with Baker, um, before finding lean and it was always, you know, get it done, go as fast as you can work as hard as you can work nights and weekends if need be. Um, you know, we always called, you know, putting in a half a day that was working from 6 AM to 6 PM working a half a day is what we called that. So, um, it was, uh, it was rewarding, <laughs> uh, but it was also kind of stressful. And um, uh, coming, coming around that 15 year mark, uh, my kids were younger and there were some more demands on my time uh, for soccer games and ballet recitals and things. And um, it was about that time that I found Lean. And um, I think our president, uh, Dan Baker had, uh, was hearing about it in some of the circles he was running in. And this was in like 2005, 2006 and said, Hey, we got to figure out what this lean stuff is. Um, it sounds like it's, it's coming and, um, we want to, we want to make sure that we were able to service our customers, um, mainly our GC clients that if they, if they say, Hey, do you, can you guys do lean? We want to be able to say yes. So I was tasked with going out and figure out what lean was. And uh, there wasn't much at all out there. There was some manufacturing stuff, but very little in construction. Um, finally did stumble across the uh, LCI, Lean Construction Institute, and attended a two day uh, seminar with uh, Cynthia Sow, uh, Greg Howell and Glenn Ballard uh, at the University of Cincinnati. So um, I, uh, 
did uh, you know for a while it was um, in and, and Greg and Glenn and Cynthia but they're all academics and um, I had just finished my I got elected to be that the guinea pig because um, I had just finished my MBA at uh, Xavier University another Cincinnati school and they said well you're used to the kind of that stuff and um, you could take the academic uh, you know wallop and 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 see if it's for real or not. So I did, and uh, it was tough. It was still tough, um, have, even having been in the academic world recently, um, to get, get my head around it. And then we did the airplane game. We did the, the Lego airplane game, and that is when my light bulb went off. And I was like, oh, man, this, this could do it. This could be the thing. Um, prior to that, in about 2001, that's when I finished my MBA. So it was it spring of the, or winter of that year, we... Um, we did my final capstone course was around a book called The Goal by Eliyahu Goldratt, Theory of Constraints. Right. Fantastic, fantastic. Herbie and the Boy Scouts and yep. everything. And uh, so since 2001, I had been applying it somewhat to my own projects. So didn't know about Lean, didn't hadn't heard about Lean until more like 2006. So I had like five, four or five years of experimenting with theory of constraints kind of thinking, uh, even though it was all manufacturing and man, it was hard to really, you know, no direct correlation to what we do. Um, but the principles were all there. So I started applying some of those on projects and started getting some really good results. We were able to go a little bit faster. We were safer. Um, our, our product productivities were a little bit better and then found, uh, last planner and LCI in 2006, 2007. And we started implementing on a project. Um, we got some consultants to come in and teach us how to do it and mainly last planner and, um, I didn't understand it all in the beginning, um, all the different parts and pieces, uh, PPC. I didn't, I couldn't get my head around that in the beginning. Um, but what I saw, what I saw was my foreman and superintendents getting together and really having these great conversations and really working stuff out and, um, doing it before we hit, you know, hit a, hit a wall or, you know, run into an issue. So I was all for it. So it only took about two or three weeks of doing that to say, wow, this is really, this is really awesome. And, um, and then, you know, as time went on, did some more studying, realized some of those pieces that I kind of threw off the truck initially, I was like, Ooh, looking back, like I shouldn't have done that. We really need to put these back on the truck. And, um, so, um, that was a lesson learned for me about, um, but even want to coach teams now, I don't, I don't throw anything off the truck. I may, I may ratchet it down to the very minimum, right. but I'm not going to say it's only these three things or these five things. It's, it's all 10 or whatever the number is. And uh, so then, um, so then uh, deployed it at Baker for six years uh, as, as uh, an internal coach uh, and lean champion. And so I was still an operations manager. Uh, so lean was kind of my, uh, my nights and weekends and, and, and hobby, I guess you would say. The other half of your work day. The other half of my work, the other half, yeah, the, the other six to six. Yeah. yeah. And um, so then, um, so did that, so then did it internally for, for six years, uh, did about 40 some projects, 30 to 35, 40, something like that projects that coached, um, mainly in my region. So I had some that I was d directly in control of, and those went way better than the ones where I was coaching teams that I was not in control of. Um, because when the teams that I was, uh, I was, and when I could, when I controlled the people's money and their raises and bonuses and reviews and everything went through me, when I said, we're doing lean, they did it. When I went to another region where I was not the boss, it didn't go over at all. So uh, that was kind of a lesson learned. Um, so anytime uh, I would go to these other regions, I would say, you know, hey, boss man of the region, this is your program. I'll be your coach, I'll be your person to help you, but you have to make this happen and you have to do things to make this, and, and you have to not subvert it either. <laughs> right. Don't do not do the things that can, that can uh, put it into a tailspin. So then, uh, so then uh, after Baker, this was around 2012, I left and went with Greg Howe's company uh, for the um, better part of a year. And after that, left and started my own company, On Point Lean, and have been doing it ever since. Yeah, congratulations, yeah. man. You've got, uh, you have good, good references. You've got a lot of mutual friends that think the world of you in the way that you operate. They're like, this guy oh, gets thanks. it. Yeah, you're welcome. So yeah, anybody listening, if you can't tell from his rough and gruff descriptions, He's got uh, boots on the ground. He knows how to make it happen with real live teams. He's not academic and he's not scared of academia. either. There's nothing wrong with reading a good research paper and figuring out Absolutely. some good experiments to try. Like 
a lot of people do get caught up on PPC. Like uh, Jesse Hernandez and I did an entire hour just beating PPC to death uh, on our review of the Lean Builder book. So there's like a lot of good times. <laughs> I suggest you uh, check out the Learns and Missteps podcast where we did that in an episode. If you ever want to hear, <laughs> yeah, you want to hear some people talk <laughs> about that. But yeah, a lot of people that learn pull planning never even touch PPC, which is just plan percent complete. Yeah. And they don't know right. why to look at it. It's not explained well. And that's just a function, I think, of a telephone game. Like somebody learns something that learns it from somebody else that doesn't go to the source. And the next thing you know that people think they're getting letter grades or you have a general contractor using PPC to Pareto chart, find out who's the worst offender and just beating down on a trade contractor instead of realizing that they're creating the conditions that are making them have that PPC because they're not doing reverse phase pull planning or reverse phase or just stepping through backwards and forwards passes of the, of the sequence. Mm -hmm. Cause they want to just jump right to calendar time or they're just trying to push a schedule and take in everybody listening. If you take your P six schedule, your critical path method schedule, and you vomit that onto a whiteboard with sticky notes, you have not done pull planning, nor have you done last planner system. All you've done is found another way to micromanage. Congratulations on your creativity. <laughs> but that's not you got a very colorful P six is all you got, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I think it I think it'd be really good uh for the listeners to hear one of your bad experiences. They say that uh, good news travels, but bad news <laughs> travels even faster. So could you share a bad last planner system story? I have seen in my time several um failed implementations. Um, where it didn't catch on. Um, yeah, let's hear one and, of those so we can talk about what, if people are trying the same thing, we could give them some nuggets so they can avoid abort or adapt. Yeah. It's, it's really around, it really circles back to leadership, you know, they, you know, say it always starts at the top and, and that is, it's so true, uh, with lean and anything else, safety, uh, anything, any other, um, thing you're trying to improve. Um, if, if the leadership doesn't um, support it and push it, um, it will die very quickly on the vine. Um, so I've seen that happen. I've seen where they'll get pushed back and, and they're like, well, you know, Bob's, he, Bob's been here for 30 years and he's a good guy. And, you know, we don't want to overburden Bob. And, and uh, so then it, Bob thinks he's got a free pass and he just can skip out. And then pretty soon the meeting's tail off and then they just come to a stop and then they're just back to their normal firefighting. You know, I've seen, I've seen that happen several times. Um, um, I, I've seen, I've seen very, but very rarely where it can be turned to the dark side. <laughs> that is what I call it. I'm a, I'm a huge star Wars fan. You know, I you know, grew up in the seventies with the star Wars. I think I saw the first one like nine times in the theater or something, but you can, you can turn, um, lean to the dark side. Um, I've had, um, GCs send, uh, put people on notice for PPC and things like that. And I'm like, Oh God, wow. why are you doing that? Don't do that. Um, so, or, or just use it as a, as a bat. You know, I tell them, you know, you, you go in, you do a pull plan, you give people information. Sometimes you'll see a GC take over and start moving the sticky notes and saying, okay, you're doing this, then this, then this, then this. And, you know, people just kind of shrug their shoulders and, and then they come back at you afterwards with like a, a bat made out of sticky notes. Uh, oh, no, you said, you said, you said, and like, well, no, there's this thing at the bottom where it said, I need this. I need the tower crane for two hours a day, or I need this out of my way, or if you can get this approval by this time. And they forget about all that. Like, no, 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 you said you'd be done November 1st or whatever. And it's like, well, yeah, but you got to read the whole thing. Right. So those are some of the negatives that I've seen and some of the, the twisting that I've seen it. So it's usually the leadership and or um, being misapplied, I guess you would say, the misapplication of it, the two biggies. I'd, I'd classify those definitely as leadership. And if we don't, uh, even as a leader, like you have to get mm -hmm. at least half a step ahead of the people or you want to follow you. So if you're a leader, listen to Dave's examples here. If you're trying to use the traditional push scheduling methods that you, you pass out your 75 page six week look ahead to a bunch of people. And you just hammer people on dates on like on finish dates. And you forget all that predecessor activity that you didn't clear out that you didn't make ready for them. You don't have any authority to hammer people for not making it. Cause you've done zero 
to give them what you promised them, which is an area to work and do productive work. I, I like that. Absolutely. I love that, Dave. You're, you're, <laughs> you're bringing, you're bringing, I don't love that that happens, but I love that it's consistently it something that crashes people. That's definitely a good example. And I think, uh, you know, just to unpack the PPC a little bit, the plan percent complete, as people finish, for those of you that have never seen Last Planner in real life, as people finish every day work that they committed to, they typically draw a line through the tag, and then the superintendent comes behind them and draws another line, creating an X. And we see the same thing in design as well. And if you're using a digital solution, there's a way to mark that this activity is complete, and that will automatically count PPC. I've heard people say that they don't know how to calculate PPC. So just for everybody, like if I had 10 tags planned, for today, Dave and I are working and, and he does five and I do four and we've X'd off and the superintendent agrees, you know, Stacy, the superintendent says, yes, Dave and Felipe, you did do these tags and I can't finish one. There's one uncrossed off tag. It's just nine divided by 10 times a hundred or 90%, which Glenn Ballard and Greg would say we were, we were saying, Sandbagging if we had 90% PPC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like those kind of the rules of, you know, if you're, uh, and, and, and I've seen this with PPC is if you're, if you're in the mid 70, low 70s, the mid 70s, say 70 to 75, you're probably um, on track schedule wise, and you're probably right on with your labor hours, uh, your efficiencies. Um, once you get above that, then you start to gain, you start to, we're, we're gaining time on the schedule. If we're in the high seventies or low eighties, uh, or upper eighties, we're probably gaining on schedule and we're probably banking labor hours as well. We're probably doing it for less than what we originally planned to. And, and then I say, um, you know, if you're steadily in the, uh, good teams, you know, you'll, you'll be high eighties, low nineties, but if you're constantly in the mid, mid nineties and above, you're, you're probably just lying. You're probably gaming the system or fooling yourself. Um, and I had one team in my, and I probably, I probably, t I've counted, I've, pro I've touched over 400 different project teams, uh, probably go closer to 500 now. Um, I've had one team that actually was running in the mid to upper nineties, 96, 95, 94, 92, 97, 94, you know, week after week, and I'm like, okay, guys, this, what, what are you doing? And um, it was a, uh, a high rise uh, bed tower in Vegas. And the, these, this team was really dialed in to tact, even though they didn't know what tact was, they never heard of tact. Um, but they were on a cycle, they were cycle time, cycle time, cycle yeah. time. And um, I said, man, you guys are good. And, and they said, yeah, if the people are in, you know, the subs, if they're supposed to be out of an area, and they're not, we throw their stuff off the building. And you only have to do that one time. You only have to do that one time. And they get, they, they understand cycle time or tact uh, very quickly. And uh, I don't know that they ever actually did that, but maybe back in the old days they did. I don't think they currently did it, but, oh. but they got on, they got on a flow, man. And they, and they understand the value of money and time uh, when you're talking about casinos and making million millions of dollars a day, they don't, they don't mess around. So that was one team that ran in the high nineties and did it. And, and, um, without and without gaming it or anything like that it can be done ppc absolutely oh yeah absolutely and you'll have you'll have weeks when you get 100 hey hey we got all 10 things done hey great you know but that's it's not typical that you you get that all day every day for sure yeah. it's, it's still construction we still have variation quite a bit as people are setting up their last planner system dave and right. the closer the closer they can build it when they're doing their phase pull plan to being like a tack plan or a cycle where they can see some repetition and, and they size the area and the handoff small enough that you can see real good progress and handoffs from one trade to another in areas, mm -hmm. the more likely you'll see PPC numbers 80% and higher consistently week over week. Yeah. Yeah, definitely breaking it down to smaller areas. Yeah, that was one of the big things from, from Janosch. Um that I learned was, you know, you know, don't, you know, for new construction, obviously it changes when you get into renovation and other types of work, but, uh, for new construction, your, your, your batch size or your tacked areas, uh, need to be about 2000 square meters or 8,000 square feet. That's about as big as you want them to be. And, and actually too, I'd like to learn a little bit more from you about scrum. I saw you have a new book out yeah. and, um, I really, so I've been, uh, I've been in the, in the lean world. There we go. Construction scrum. I saw nice. So I just got uh, Jason Schroeder's uh, books on uh, 
tact and some other things. Yeah. I wanted to check into that. I've got some um, experience with tact and Janos uh, from BMW uh, did a plant with him in Mexico for BMW in like 2015. So I got kind of baptized into it there, but um, it looks like Jason's kind of taken it to a whole new level, which is kind of cool. And really want to find out what the scrum is about. But uh, I mean, I, I sort of know about enough to be dangerous about it. And I know that's kind of your your thing. And uh, so I was hoping you could be a, a long, convert a long time lean person that probably thinks they already do scrum uh, <laughs> intact. I, and, I, and I do. Uh, I think they, deep down, if you said, do you already do that? I would say that I do, but I'm probably confident um, in that we don't, I don't do it as well as, uh, I probably could or get the most out of it. So I'd like to, well, look, I, learned, chat with you about that too. I got a chance to go to Germany, Dave, and hang out with Janosch in his home turf mm -hmm. at BMW, their big, uh, corporate headquarters and found out in Munich, yeah. he is actually a scrum master himself. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. So we have that in common. No. I saw some of the things he was doing. I said, you know, I was like, that looks suspiciously familiar. <laughs> and then he admitted to me he's like oh yeah i'm a scrum master it's like aha uh, i knew it gotcha. yeah, yeah there you go and i was i told him that uh even tact intact if you do tact well i would consider the person facilitating as the train conductor it could be the mm -hmm. superintendent or it could be somebody like yourself or janosh or jason schroeder or spencer if you're so fortunate to have one of you on your team, on your project, then those individuals are acting exactly like a scrum master, serving the team, helping to eliminate mm -hmm. roadblocks, getting things out of the way, helping to get the plan, just pulling out from people what can be an ideal plan, a better plan, and then yeah. letting those trains get out of the station and make it happen. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, cool. so that's, that's really good. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Janosch. He put us through a simulation. I got to... I'll just uh, I'll share a Janosch story. So it's it's Jason, myself, Spencer, and a couple other folks and that Janosch has brought in. And we're going to mm -hmm. do his simulation game, which I'm sure is how he taught you in Mexico as well. Blue roof panels yep. and the little Ex foundations. Exactly. The, yeah. He says, yep. he's like, I'm going to give you guys 15 minutes to plan. You can plan any way you want. You can scrum, you can last planner, whatever. And then we're going to try your way. And then I'm going to create the tag plan with you. And then we'll try my way. And so we went two hours. Oh, no and way. We yeah. first he try. was he was just so fascinated. No, two hours of planning before oh. we before we did anything for so everyone listening, for a fifteen minute simulation. Jason Schroeder, myself and Spencer. We oh, planned geez. for like two hours. Yeah. And then finally Janos is like, That's enough. He's like, That's enough. Guys, you gotta He's like, you got to start. And we were like in the planning, we were starting to like fight with each other a little bit on like how, how it was going to go. And we thought as small as a batch size as possible. So we had something like 54 areas. And when we finally did go into the simulation, we finished in 14 minutes and change, which Janos thought was like shocking that we actually finished under the 15 minute window. And then, yeah. he, then he told us that the, the record time is something sub eight minutes. Wow. And then he had us go through, we, we went back through and created a tact. And then I think we finished in an easy peasy 10 ish minutes. Okay. Something, something around there. And Spencer or Jason, if you're listening, you can correct my times if I'm wrong. I don't remember the exact times, but, but the time with him, like we, when we fell into the tact and I'm saying fall into the tact cause we like fell into a flow. We lost track of who was in charge and it really did become a system of pool, like almost effortless pull and i do remember jason singing during uh the second round there were no stern all the stern voices and the harsh conversations were gone from the first round all was forgiven and <laughs> running, running intact was just so smooth and so much fun i told janosh i said i'm i was taking notes and i said i'm going to figure out how to scrum this whole thing make the backlog and follow the steps of how you showed us because it absolutely does fit inside of the Scrum framework, and you can use Scrum with Tact or Tact inside of the Scrum framework. So, Dave, okay. just to awesome. an just to answer your question, since you did you did bring up the book Construction Scrum, ladies and gentlemen. I did, I did. I'm quite is, interested. Yeah, this uh, is not about the book, but Dave asked on his own, unprompted. Your checks in the mail, Dave. <laughs> so i did see the forward you put the forward out there maybe in a, a couple chapters or yeah, something like that yeah. in a download or something like that yeah so i, I think I, I read the first uh, page or so and 
Yeah. yeah. So it looked, it looked interesting. I think we, we made like 50 pages free or something. It's quite mm-hmm. quite a big chunk of the book is available for free at uh, constructionscrum.com. But in a nutshell, Dave, Scrum is a framework built on lean foundations. So it absolutely honors all the work done. Uh, companies like Toyota and uh, William Edwards Deming and others. But those are just some mm-hmm. of my favorites. Those are some of my favorites. I'm biased. Where can you pull this in? Like if I'm already mm-hmm. mid-flight on a job, could I start to – if I'm listening now and I'm already on a project, could I start Scrum now even though it's not day one? Yes, you can. Sure. If I'm about to implement TACT, could I start doing Scrum? Yes, you can. Also in Jason's uh, book, his new TACT book, a dish, second edition, there's a chapter on Scrum, my contribution. You're welcome. So when you read about oh, Scrum great. and the TACT, uh, that was adapted uh, from a chapter in my book for that Scrum – for that TACT example. I think I'm on page five. With this beautiful <laughs> face as a contributor, yeah. as is Janusz. Yeah, Janusz Delui is also a contributor. He's, and, he's shown me mathematically a hundred ways why that's true, and it, it seems to work out. It really yeah. does. So if, you, if you've got smaller batches and you're breaking that into those one week chunks, um, whether it's a three weeks of three weeks of duct work or five weeks of electrical work, that's fine. But you can break it into those those chunks and and make sure you're delivering on those. And then after week one, you're one fifth of the way done. And after week two, you're two fifths of the way done. Yeah. So that's, that's where I think um, we were doing a lot of tax type stuff before, you know, it really became this big push in the industry, but not to the level. I think that uh, Jason Schroeder and, and Janosch have taken it to. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they've now with, even with Marco's help, they've brought in these three different parametrics so that you can, because Jason was saying, like, early, in his early implementations of TACT, just taking things to the 10,000 square foot level was incredibly beneficial for making good flow. And now with the parametrics, you can mathematically see if in a range, plus or minus, should you break it down smaller based on the types of work and how you've done the package. And you can gain even more throughput, give the trades even more time. It's like counterintuitive. It's like, what? I can give the trades more time change that geographic area and that radically increases the throughput time which puts more work in place with less effort with more consistent crews way higher quality so there's mm-hmm. there's a little bit of math involved but on jason's website elevating construction ist uh, he's got a new tact template that includes the parametrics on there so you can run simulations in excel and very quickly figure out, should we be at a 10,000 square foot area at 8,000? Should we go smaller? What happens if we go bigger? And then you can just pick and then still work with your trades to develop that very tightly coordinated tack plan. I've been through his training. That's the only reason I know it. Like, I'm talking like I know what I'm talking about because <laughs> yeah. I've been trained. Good. good stuff, yeah. It is good stuff, and it's out there for free, so, so check that out for sure. Dave? What what do you see from your perspective? You've been touched almost 500 projects. What is the role of a consultant like yourself to help a team implement some of these methods like Last Planner System? Um, I think there, there, I think there's a lot of different roles for the consultant. Obviously, there's that leadership role that you need from the top brass of the company that really has to support it and want it and and make it known that they want it and um, and, and really drive in it. So the consultant then. Um, really becomes the um, and when I when I deliver boot camps and stuff to kick off projects, I, I tell folks that they're they're half half education. You know what is this thing and what are we doing, and half inspiration. You know, making them want to do it, making them see the value, what's in it for them, um, and the benefits and the, and that kind of thing. So half inspiration, half education. I think is is overall in general the con- the consultant's role. Um, but then it's 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 like it's 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 like coaches, you know. Uh, you know, uh, all the greats have. You know, Michael Jordan has a coach. Uh, LeBron James has a coach. Tiger Woods. You know, you just name all these great athletes. And I think that it, it can accelerate your adoption. I think you can do lean without a coach. Um, I, I think you'll. Uh, but you can also go uh, water, white water rafting on level five rapids in West Virginia without a guide. You absolutely can get a boat and you can get a paddle and you can go do it. Uh, it might not be nearly as fun uh, without a guide that's been down through there and knows where the rocks and the swirls and the other things are. Um, so it can keep you out of trouble. Um, it can keep you from developing bad habits. 
like a, like a golf coach, you know, like, Hey, you're lifting your head, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're chicken wing in your elbow or whatever, you know, so somebody watching you do it. Um, and then you're that objective third party. And, um, you know, if, if you can bring experience and, and show them ways to do this and, and make their lives easier, I think it, it, it helps turn them on to it. Again, the inspiration side. So th- those are the, those are the primary things, right? Just, uh, just being with them, watching them through it, you know, and, and, and um, there, there's always, there's always questions, there's always pushback. And I've literally heard it all. I'm like, go, f- come on. You know, I'm like, all right, whatever you got, let's go. I've heard it. You know, <laughs> tell, tell, tell me your pushback. Not going to work in my backyard. That works um, in California. It doesn't work in, in Ohio. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's for hospitals or, um, or, or that's for jobs that where you have the same thing over and over and over again. Like if, yeah, if you're doing an 80 story high rise, yeah, man, that's just like building Toyotas, you know, in Georgetown, Kentucky. Yeah. You just do the same thing. And that's, that's where we should do lane. And I'm like, no, that's where you need it the least. <laughs> you need it the most where you have variation when the first floor is different and the second floor and the, the West wing is different than the East wing and the North, you know, that's where you really need a good plan. So those are, those are some of the, some of the pushback I get, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what the coach is there for is to just be with the team, uh, help them understand it. And, um, I, I go by the, uh, the, the boy scouts, the edge method, um, explain, uh, demonstrate, guide, and enable. So, you know, explain what we're doing, demonstrate it yourself. Here's, here's how to do it, guide them as they do it, and then enable them to, to go out on their own. And that's, that should be a, every consultant's role is to, uh, is to, you know, get them in, get it, get up in the boat, get them paddle in the right direction, get them, get them, you know, rowing at the same time. And then you hop out of the boat and go find another boat and they keep going. Best nugget there that I have yet to hear enough is that the coach is giving that objective third party look and feedback. Dave, can you share a story and you can anonymize, you know, the, the different people <laughs> where, where it's something where you saw something that was obvious to you like spots on a cow, but it was completely <laughs> people on the job were blind to it. Can you share a story like that? I, I did an interesting thing uh, several years back. So there was a large GC uh, that had like a summit of all their superintendents. So they had like 40 superintendents in the room and they had all seemed to have had some level of experience or at least over half, probably at least two thirds, if not all had some experience with lean and last planner. And, um, So they wanted, they wanted me to come and kind of, um, I think I took a half a day maybe, and they really wanted to get dialed in on, on pool planning. So we did a a pool planning, uh, simulation, one that I do, uh, typically when I'm introducing new teams and it was crazy to see how differently everybody did it. Uh, They, they, the, the way every single superintendent had a different opinion on how to, how to do it and how to do sticky notes and how to do this. And they had no consistency. So that was just a really weird thing. Like, oh my, you guys are all the same company and every single one of your people has a different opinion of how to do this and what, how to do this. And, you know, some were using swim lanes and some weren't and some were, you know, it was just all over the place. So that I found that kind of strange, but it's not that strange really because everybody, um, some people have different, you know, every, every, uh, coach is different, right. Too the, the way they teach it, the way they explain it. Um, so there's different methods and procedures. So I thought that one kind of really stood out as a, as a, wow, you know, and, you know, cause you lead to that standardization. You can't, you know, in a Toyota way, they say you can't improve anything unless you have a standard. So, um, how do you get to that? But again, I also say that anything you do lean scrum tact wise, you're better off than having not done it. Even if you don't do it to the full extent or, you know, you check every single box, you know, just do something. Do, do, if you're just doing parts of it, that's fine too. But um, you're, you're better, you get the most value if you're doing it all, right? If you're doing last planner plus scrum plus tagged and you're doing all the parts and pieces of each, that's where you're going to get the most benefit. Yeah, you can throw things out the window, and, but you're, you're decreasing your, if, your effectiveness, I think. That's true. I was with the yeah. case in point, I was with the superintendent a month ago in the middle of the country and he was using last planner, a light version of tact and scrum and his phone never rang. And we, we walked through the project and it was nothing but compliments from foreman after foreman after foreman. And the job was immaculate. It was like, just yeah. Oh, and I just, I was just thinking like, you know what? Using all these things does make a difference. Like, <laughs> It really does. I yeah. asked him, I was like, is your phone battery charged? Like, show me your phone. 
And he showed me, it's like, okay, this is different. Because usually you walk a job with a superintendent, it's just nonstop. Take another call, take another call, take another yep. call, take another call. Yeah, it'd be hard, it's hard to keep their attention for 10 minutes if, if, if that. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. So, no, I, I love that story, how there's a lot of variation. And you definitely, I, I'm, a, I'm a full subscriber to Jeffrey Liker's work, the Toad Away. And, and we're realizing some of those lessons that if you're just improving willy-nilly, you're just making more chaos. You've got mm -hmm. to have some standards to improve from so that you can holistically make massive gains and it's little improvements to make those gains. So I just want to get uh, your take. You've talked, we've talked a lot about leadership. What is the mm -hmm. difference or what role does the field personnel, the project front facing people play versus management in your experiences with either lean or last planner system? So in, involving the craft, um, and, um, you know, through the foreman and their leadership, um, down from the superintendents and their overall guidance, um, you know, you can really get some great, um, input and ideas and feedback. Um, so we started, uh, at, at Baker, we did a, um, we called them, um, just like a regular SQP safety, quality, productivity, um, uh, kind of chat if you will. And we would take uh, different folks off of different crews. We would take a rod buster and somebody off the column crew and somebody off the deck stripping crew and the, you know, a carpenter off the foundation crew, get them together, um, buy some pizza or whatever for, for lunch and sit down and just talk about what's, what's happening, what's going on. Um, you know, what, what kind of things are they seeing? What's, what's going well, what, what can we work on? And just having those open, honest, discussions really surfaced a ton of um uh things that we didn't even think about right uh, as far as for, for productivity for safety for quality so we didn't limit it to just productivity which you think of for lean we we, we threw in quality we threw in threw in safety and um just by going out and, and getting it I, I learned that you know um i see i see so often um sometimes on projects i see a suggestion box outside the the trailer and i just want to go oh, don't don't do that don't put up suggestion boxes they never work you just saw dave put a fictitious gun to his head and blow his brains out <laughs> for for those listening like, so that's doing? what that sound don't, effect was yeah, don't do that <laughs> yeah. um because it, you're not going to get anything um you know and I, I use the story like hey the last time you were out at a breakfast restaurant and you know, something was not right, you know, your eggs were a little cold or, you know, you didn't get a coffee refill. Did you actually stop and, you know, use that comment card at the Bob Evans and, and put it in there? Um, probably not. You didn't. Oh. But, you know, but I always say, but if the manager came by and said, hey, Felipe, we're really working on our, our quality and our performance at this Bob Evans. And we want we're really proud of it. We want to know if there's anything that you experienced that wasn't that you would say could be an improvement uh, for us and our chefs or our, our servers. You know, we, we, we want to hear it. You'd probably tell them. You'd probably be like, "Yeah, hey, uh, sure, yeah, my uh, my my coffee didn't get refilled, as you know, and um, my eggs were a little runny, or something like that." You know, you would give it up. But I think as leaders, you got to go get it. You got to go get those improvement ideas. You got to go get those suggestions. Um, I'm always baff. I'm always blown away when I read the uh, reread the Toyota Way and see that they get eighty thousand improvement suggestions a year uh, at one plant. And um, I think I even have the the book about um, their. Uh, suggestions toyota's suggestion system and how it says i think it was like 20 or 40 40 years and 20 million suggestions is the one of the is the subtitle on the book but they go get it they ask for it they train it they they have focus groups they 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 they, they do that so back to the craft back to your question so the craft really is the front line they're the ones seeing it they're the ones who have the heartache they're the ones who have things that bug them you know like paul Akers, you know fix what bugs you so we just bring them in and say, what's bugging you? And you'll, you'll, they'll say, you know, Hey, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're destroying the form work because the carpenters are putting way too many nails in, or, or sometimes they'll even use screws. And, and, we, and then we, we put in a thing like, okay, how many nails should we be putting in? You know, it only needs eight in this, in this, in this run, you don't need to put in 25 nails. Uh, it's not making it any better. It's just making it harder to strip. So those kinds of things would come out and just stuff like, you know, you know, uh, portalette placement and all kinds of things. And, um, 
uh, it, it really became very powerful. Um, and then it became the thing of how do you manage it and what do you do with it? So that was one of the struggles we had with it because we were doing these. We were we were giving out incentives, you know, like, hey, every time you put, turn in a, a, an improvement, you get your name in a hat and we draw, you know, a $100 Home Depot gift card or something at the end of the month and um, that kind of stuff. And it, it really worked. We, we uh, on the one job doing it for just a couple of months, I think it was like six or eight months, the last six or eight months of the job, we got like 400 um, improvement wow. suggestions and, uh, That's impressive. yeah, I, I was pretty, pretty proud of that. And I thought we did it right. We, um, we could use the focus groups to get the majority of them, but then, then you turn them loose, then you turn the folks loose and then they, they think of it, you know, while they're out there and they're like, Oh yeah, that does bug me. I'm going to write that down and put my, you know, get an entry into the monthly drawing. So, um, that's something that works. So that's where the, the field really comes in. Um, and again, once you once you do that, show that respect for people by asking them, you know, what do you think? What's your opinion? What's your take on this? Then they're involved, man. They own it. They they own the schedule, and they'll they'll move heaven and earth to make things happen if you involve them. If you're just barking orders and pushing stuff down, it's like, nah, eh, that's Dave's plan. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. We'll see. But if if I ask how long do you think it's going to take, and they tell me four days. I'm like, okay, cool. Are you sure? You know, is that, is that really good? Four days? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can do it. Okay. Then I turn them loose and by golly, it's going to be done in probably three days usually because they don't want to let you down. I love the story how you bring in the ownership, but you're doing tight couple of response, responsibility on the leader to go get it critical. Yes, absolutely. And then you're turning around immediately, taking action, empowering people to make the changes and it creates this beneficial feedback loop of more changes, more suggestions, more action, more benefits to the production, more benefits to the worker too, better respect. That's a win, 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 win. Yeah. And it perpetuates, it keeps growing. Yeah. And then the unfortunate thing is the job's over and then you got to go build that culture again on another project, but that, that's the leader's job. Absolutely. Yeah. The leader's job. Dave, it has been an honor talking to you. You delivered as promised. Your PPC, I'm going to give it to you right now. You're at 100%. Oh, wow. <laughs> there's Appreciate definitely, that. yeah, there's definitely more things we need to talk about. I'm going to give sure, you the last word. Back. Yeah, and I'm going to have you come back 100%. You get the last word, and then we're going to call this, we're going to call this one, we're going to shift this to the done column. 10 4. Oh, well, I'll just close close uh, out by saying, um, I mean, thank you, Felipe, for what you're doing, um, for bringing this out into the world. I think it's been sorely lacking. And, and um, I know it was lacking definitely for me when I started uh, however many years ago. And I think this is, is this is a great resource for folks to, um, you know, learn and learn from others and stuff like that, too, if they don't have the option of, uh, you know, intermingling at LCI and other places like that, where you do get that great um that great coming, the gathering of minds and, and sharing of information and things. So I think we definitely need more of these. I think we need more, you know, podcasts and, and blogs and things like that, that, that give people the tools and resources. I think, you know, things like the lean builder and, and uh, you know, the uh, tacting and stuff that, that, that Janosch is doing and elevate, you know, what Jason's doing. I think that's all been, uh, been really cool to see, uh, see it come, see it grow. Cause I, I know when I was out there, it was, it was a desert and there was nothing. And now, now, uh, now I look across the desert and I see Las Vegas, I see Felipe and I see Jason and I see all these people in construction. So, so kudos to you for doing what you're doing. It has been so much fun. Can't wait to have you back on very soon. Very special. Thanks to my guest. I'm Felipe engineer Manriquez. The EBFC show is created by Felipe and produced by a passion to build easier and better. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Let's go build.